uh, sorry, I haven't been paying attention to how these transitions are, are uh, generally handled. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so uh, I'm not sure how many people are wandering in for uh, this um, perhaps odd uh, subject here, but um, uh, there was a uh, was kind of an appeal a few days ago uh, hey, is there some subject that you're passionate about? And imagining this to be more of an unconference than it actually turned out to be, um, I said, well, you know, I could do a talk about uh, the, the great streetcar conspiracy, the, the National City Lines conspiracy, if you want. And uh, to my surprise was uh, uh, added to the schedule. So I don't have an elaborate presentation, although I did throw together a few slides to um, kind of set the stage, but then I hope after uh, eight or 10 minutes, uh, we can end up uh, chatting more about uh, this urban myth that is at the, uh, oh, I guess at the base of a lot of, especially young uh, transit activists uh, understanding of the subject and, um, and where that comes from and why, <laughs> why there's very little truth to it. So let me, uh, Pop this up. Uh, this is when I always worry about what you're actually going to see on my uh, on my laptop here. And uh, uh, this is the one that I want. All right. Uh, somebody tell me you're seeing that. Yeah. So we can see that. You're all good. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, so I started poking into this, oh, 30 years ago, I was working at American Planning Association, but my, uh, my background includes a law degree and, uh, uh, and then a, a, just a, uh, a fascination with all things transport and transit related. And so I began wondering about this story that uh, we had all heard whispers about in college. Of course, this is before the internet and uh, it wasn't quite as uh, easy to research things in those days. So I built up quite a file of uh, photocopied documents. Uh, I noticed uh, yesterday that many of these are now available online at archive.org or uh, Google Books. So it's pretty easy to read things like the old antitrust uh, case decisions and appeals. So let's, um, let me just uh, start at the, uh, at the beginning. The, the basic story, which you know sounds fascinating, is how General Motors in cahoots with Standard Oil of California and Firestone somehow systematically bought up the streetcar systems all across America in order to substitute inferior bus service and therefore force the transit riders to buy cars. So the story is usually enhanced by telling how uh, GM et al was found guilty by a federal court and fined a paltry $5,000. That was actually the maximum fine at the time. And it's usually accompanied by glowing remembrances of the Los Angeles red car Pacific electric system contrasted with stalled uh, traffic on an LA freeway. And it's been reported, uh, repeated in books, uh, even on 60 Minutes, uh, a PBS point of view program called Taken for a Ride that's pretty easy to find on YouTube. <laughs> Only problem is it isn't true. Uh, GM was acquitted of that charge, not convicted. And you might think that that's an important distinction, but uh, the people who want to uh, believe this, uh, it hasn't seemed to uh, trouble them at all to a lead from one charge about monopolizing the sale of gas and tires and buses to these small city systems, and the other charge that it was a del deliberate conspiracy to destroy these small town system. So if General Motors was guilty of anything, it was of wanting the National City Lines properties to buy GM buses rather than Ford or Twin Coach or Fajol buses, whatever. Uh, so uh, the problem is that, as you see from the tab there in the center, this whole story got cited during some 1974 Senate hearings on a now forgotten proposal to break up big uh, corporations called the Industrial Reorganization Act. 
and there was a staff attorney for the subcommittee on antitrust and monopoly, a fellow named Bradford Snell, who I believe is still living. Uh, and he wrote a paper called American Grand Ground Transport in which he wove this rather elaborate conspiracy, including everything from traitorous activity by GM's German subsidiary during the war to uh, GM supposedly forcing US railroads to purchase its locomotives. This was introduced into the hearing record because he was on the staff after all, and uh, then published with the imprimatur of the US Senate uh, for which the, uh, the chairman of the committee later apologized. So meanwhile, these various uh, serious books, uh, whether we're talking about Stephen Goddard's Getting There uh, or um, some magazine articles in the 90s, uh, they all picked up this story and ran with it. Uh, this was long before there was anything called uh, Snopes or uh, any other way to kind of uh, check these urban myths. So in the beginning days of the internet, it was kind of hilarious. Uh, Wikipedia had um, uh, two competing articles under different titles. Uh, I looked yesterday and they've now largely been reconciled. But for a while, there was one about national city lines that I think um, uh, was the conspiracy theory. And there was another called the Great uh, Streetcar Conspiracy Theory that demolished the, the urban myth. And so we had these two articles that were at complete loggerheads on their conclusion. And you know, eventually enough edit wars uh, kind of wore down the rough edges on these. And, uh, and so, as I say today, they both seem to uh, hew pretty closely to, what I, to my understanding of the factual sources. So um, let me see. Um, I mean, here's a, I've got a, an article here in my hand from uh, Cy Adler of Portland State uh, from the early 90s, in which uh, uh, he, he begins by saying, uh, uh, everything Bradford Snell wrote in American Ground Transport was about Los Angeles was wrong. And uh, at the heart of this is that Snell mixes up the Pacific Electric, the red car interurban network that tied together the archipelago of urban settlements all across Southern California, uh, sometimes, but not always, on uh, independent right of way, not all that much of that, uh, with the yellow cars of Los Angeles Railway Company, which was the conventional, in fact, narrow gauge uh, streetcar system of Los Angeles. It, didn't, it, it did not expand to keep up with LA's tremendous growth in the teens and 20s. And so eventually uh, the red car system far outstripped it in importance in Southern California. But uh, Snell uh, got the, the two of uh, them mixed up and uh, uh, <laughs> National City Lines never had any involvement with the Pacific Electric at all. So uh, most of what he writes is just uh, very easy to refute. And it's easy to refute all the way through when you start looking into the details of it. But um, this is um, the Electric Railway Directory of 1924. And there were, I wanna say 1200 uh, different streetcar companies in the United States alone. And by 1975, we were down to seven cities that were running streetcars. This was before the modern uh, light rail uh, reinvigoration of that, uh, uh, that technology. So what caused all of them to give up the streetcars if it wasn't a great conspiracy? Well, we'll get back to that, I hope, uh, when we uh, chat about the individual subjects in a minute. But it was just a hell of a lot cheaper to run buses. Once the, the bus had been proven, uh, technology in the 20s, uh, even the big streetcar systems like uh, 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 Chicago, I'm gonna use a lot of slides from Chicago because I happen to have them handy when I was putting this together this week. So here's the northern, uh, the north side of Chicago. The dashed lines are the bus extensions 
that the streetcar company began running in the early 1930s, uh, much cheaper than extending wire and track out into these new areas where the new homes were being built, new neighborhoods out on the outskirts of the city. And so people look at that map or they look at a, a, a photo like this. This is Polish Triangle Division, Ashland and uh, Milwaukee and uh, yearn for the good old days. But um, when I was a kid, there was a book called The Good Old Days. They were terrible. And uh, it uh, <laughs> uh, talked about all the things that uh, we uh, yearn for in this hazy nostalgia, but that weren't really so great. So you look here and uh, not only do you notice that there's already a, a, a fair amount of traffic that keeps the streetcars from maintaining any sort of schedule, especially if someone is trying to turn left in front of them, uh, but also how you're, they're having to board out in the middle of the street. So you see the woman in white there at the, the, on the right-hand side of the slide uh, having to walk out to the street. And so anyone who's ridden Queen or King Street in Toronto is familiar with the problems of street running streetcars. Uh, here's downtown Chicago, Clark Street, and you see how you're having to wade out into fairly heavy traffic to board this PCC car. Uh, in Chicago, we had something, uh, things called safety islands, and there's an old bit of uh, Chicago drivel that uh, there's no geese on Goose Island and there's no safety on a safety island, uh, especially in the snow, uh, you can imagine standing out in the middle of Cermak Road uh, with these big trucks barreling towards you on a icy snowy day and all that is saving you as you're waiting out there for the, uh, the number 21 streetcar is, uh, you know, this one traffic signal with a light on it that says safety island. So as I've said, Chicago uh, had at first independent bus companies, and then by the 1930s, the street railway company was adding its own uh, extension buses. In some cases, they were stringing trolley wire and doing trolley buses. In other cases, they were using uh, motor buses, which uh, with the, especially with the invention of the automatic transmission, uh, General Motors buses in particular became much easier to drive and much smoother for the patrons to ride. So the end came in Chicago in 1958, uh, the very last streetcar on uh, July, uh, June 23rd. And uh, same for systems all over the country. This is suburban Chicago. The streetcars quit tomorrow. The buses start on Sunday morning, uh, providing the substitute service. And the story is the same uh, all over the, the country. Big factor that um, gets sometimes overlooked is the 1935 um, antitrust law that basically required all of the power utilities, the uh, Public Utilities Holding Company Act, to sell off their unrelated subsidiaries. And many of these electric companies around the country were running street railways as subsidiaries that bought a lot of power from them. Uh, others were very closely tied to uh, real estate development syndicates. Uh, many of them in the early days had been kind of steals uh, where construction companies were organized to fleece the shareholders of the street railway company out of all of their money building the lines. And then once it was time to operate, well, suddenly there was a bankruptcy reorganization. So the, you know, the industry was in terrible trouble by the beginnings of the 1920s and then widespread growth in auto ownership began not only to skim off the cream of the riders, but also to compete with the street railways as middle-class auto owners ran jitney service that would run along the, the heavy streetcar routes ahead of a car and pick up uh, the riders who were waiting they were happy enough to give their nickel to a guy driving his own Model T or Model A as to wait for the, uh, the streetcar that was a few minutes behind. And so this begins to, uh, the, the industry begins to suffer from that as well. So by the 1950s, the opinion was pretty unanimous that uh, buses were the wave of the future. Uh, they 
could get out of the traffic to a limited extent. They could pick up the riders on the curb where it was safer for them to wait. In many cities, buses could be run with a single operator, whereas the labor contracts tied the streetcar companies to having two-man crews uh, on the streetcars. That was certainly the case for a lot of the routes in Chicago. And uh, the operating costs were much, much lower. Uh, the streetcar companies in many cases had to, uh, the responsibility to maintain not just their track, but paving on both sides of the track. And as the uh, city, uh, as auto ownership grew, uh, that pavement was the most attractive surface in much uh, weather for auto owners to run on, so they were always slowing down the traction. Uh, we are still three decades away from getting any sort of operating assistance for uh, local transportation. That doesn't come until 1964, really 1970 uh, for most parts of the country. And so it is just the logical reaction by uh, little company after company to substitute the cheaper to run buses. And in a few cases to um, uh, take up, uh, to allow the buyout offer that comes from national city lines. So here is a list of the cities that were tied to national city lines. It's roughly 45 different cities. You'll see none of them are very large. The largest are kind of grouped uh, in the lower right corner uh, because of the way that I uh, put this list together, the various sources. And so there really are only five, a half dozen cities of any size. Uh, many of them are very small cities where if it weren't for the folks coming in and substituting buses, there, there would not have been any local transportation at all to survive into the era of public uh, funding and public ownership. In some of the cities, in fact, the national city lines uh, continued to run streetcars, even bought new rolling stock. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it, uh, what city it was that they uh, placed a big order uh, for, I want to say St. Louis. Um, but anyway, they continued to actually run streetcars. Uh, Los Angeles is another example. Until the day that public ownership took over in LA, that came in 1963, and they promptly, <laughs> under public ownership, switched to the cheaper buses. So the problem with the National City Lines conspiracy theory is that it proves too much. Um, as I've said, we had uh, roughly a thousand different street railway cities in the 1920s. We had seven in 1975, but GM or National City Lines was only involved with 45 or 46 of these. So this was a pretty amazing conspiracy to have begun 20 years before National City Lines was formed, lasted 20 years after it was dissolved, and to have spread so far beyond the, the cities where they had any ownership, even to the municipally owned systems like Chicago uh, or New York. Uh, meanwhile, streetcars disappeared from every city in South America, virtually every city in Japan, Australia, China, Korea, India, Africa, Spain, France, Italy, Great Britain, Canada, Mexico. Uh, it's only in the Nordic countries and Germany, uh, the low uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, that as well as the old Soviet bloc, that uh, trams survive uh, until the light rail era begins circa 1980. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my presentation and um, uh, so that uh, this becomes more of a discussion and uh, uh, invite you to uh, unmute yourself and quiz me. Uh